welcome to our final demo for the Spotlight Virtual Tri Tribunals work cycle. Um, we're going to walk through, I think, some of the, the higher uh, level features that we delivered in this work cycle. So for the last um, uh, something like 17 weeks, it sounds like 17 working weeks, we've been working on this project, which is a long work cycle for us. So we're pretty happy to, to see what we've been able to deliver. So uh, just to recap, um, the goal of this particular work cycle was to focus on building out um, a fully featured uh, platform for virtual tribunals for materials from the East Timor Tribunal um, to fulfill grant obligations from the uh, Hewlett Foundation for a grant that we have currently. Uh, the elevator pitch was for researchers and users who want access to documentation of post-conflict tribunals. Uh, virtual tribunals is an interactive platform that enables interdisciplinary research across multiple tribunals. Unlike uh, other initiatives, it provides feature-rich access to materials to a broad variety of user groups. So in terms of the scope, uh, what we focused on uh, for the software development work cycle was building out primarily the full text search of uh, OCR text in Spotlight for discovery. So this allows what we call search cross functionality and for hit highlighting, uh, support for multilingual search for English, Portuguese, and Indonesian, um, support for the IIIF content search implementation, which allows you to search within specific documents within the context of um, with, uh, the viewer. Uh, interna internationalization of user elements and feature pages. So this was a specific feature set that allows uh, exhibit curators and administrators to provide translations for content, uh, for the user facing content in Spotlight. Um, and then a sort of, this is also more broadly con contextualized in a larger project, which is also preparing content, uh, creating metadata, uh, accessioning content in SDR and creating the exhibit. So for out of scope are any non uh, East Timor materials, uh, support for access controls, support for internationalization of the metadata and the administrative user interface, um, the uh, support for office document and PDF rendering in Universal Viewer and right to left, left language support. One of the things that, uh, two unresolved issues that we resolved during the course of the project were sort of where the IIIF content ser search service exists in our stack. Um, and sort of, a, and where we've ultimately decided is that it's, it's sort of set as a, sh uh, a shared service for in the access here of uh, the Stanford Digital Repository. So while the, uh, the content that we're delivering for this, this project uh, is, you know, is an SDR. The intent is that this will be a more broadly usable service for other full text content that we have, have image based full text content that will be an SDR. Um, we also resolved the theming requirements. Uh, we, there were no sort of major issues regarding theming for this project. Um, and then there were some concerns about how the work that we were doing in this project sort of followed on from the previous Vatican uh, work, cycle, uh, work cycle for, for the Vatican Library. Um, and short of a few sort of technical debt things, I don't think there was too much of a direct impact other than at the beginning of the work cycle. So the project community and stakeholders are our funders and project partners, um, which includes the Hewlett Foundation, the Honda Center, and curators at, at Stanford Libraries. Uh, the tribunals and the residual mechanisms, uh, researchers, uh, people can, impacted by conflict, and a, a great category of everyone else. Mm -hmm. as, as you can see, the project team is here at the core. And uh, we'll, we'll sort of just to gloss on this at a high level, our tech, technical solution um, for this project relies on SDR uh, Spotlight, including some new development in Spotlight, some changes to the Universal Viewer that were outsourced to a company called Digerati, uh, and the creation of a new implementation of the IIIF content search, which we've just sort of creatively decided to call content search. Um, and, but we'll, we're perhaps looking for, for uh, new names. 
So uh, in terms of risks for the projects, um, I think we addressed most of these. Uh, the ones which are, I think, remain that, that sort of ended up remaining were a lack of clarity on some of the acceptance criteria for, uh, for testing things like full text and multilingual search. Um, we did create a, a, a draft search, sort of search usability protocol um, that we have not yet run, but it, it is something, but uh, sort of with the timing of the close of this work cycle, we'll probably not be able to make too many adjustments, at least at this point. Um, we addressed some of the concerns um, around both the timing of the, the demo to the MIT, um, uh, given that there was, there were some back and forth communication issues sort of about scheduling that meeting, um, that ended up not being an issue. Um, and then we resolved sort of the incorporation of some of these features. Uh, uh, so the exhibit, so virtual tri tribunals is set up to be an exhibit in, at Spotlight at Sanford. The changes that we made to Spotlight, uh, particularly around things like full text search, uh, full text search support, and the tr and internationalization are generalizable to other spotlight instances the content search is something which is generalizable to other content in sdr so it we have we i think we've sort of situated the right trade-off for well sort of what we needed to deliver for this project and how the sort of plays up plays across to some of our other service offer offerings there's still some open questions about what we're actually going to be delivering uh, uh or, or what digirati is going to be delivering in terms of changes to universal viewer there, in particular, there are changes that still yet to be made to improve the search user experience um, for the content search. So, so how, how that behavior kind of plays out. Uh, so the project team includes uh, myself, uh, Kathy Esther, um, Chris Beer, Jesse Keck, Camille Villa, Drew Winget, Jack Reed, um, and previously included Darren Hardy, who has since departed Stanford, uh, Gary Geisler, um, Penelope Van Tyle, Chris Kasanovich, Ben Albritton, uh, Arcadia Falcone, um, Honda Center student employees, and then management liaisons, including Hannah Frost, Tom Kramer, and Stu Snyderman. Uh, and Rob Smith from the operations team has uh, been our liaison uh, for operations. So since, the, uh, since we started the project, uh, the timeline has clearly shifted. Um, uh, development is, concluding essentially now uh, in late April and early May. And our grant timeline, uh, is our grant wraps uh, by August 1st. So we have about two to three months left to, to create the exhibit. Um, so we've got a little bit of flexibility there, but, but we are kind of behind the original schedule that we intended. Um, so trade-off sliders, I think, are pretty much the same as the beginning of the project. We were able to, um, we didn't have to compromise much on scope, I think, in a big picture way. We had a pretty good understanding of what we needed to deliver. Uh, we, um, uh, this was sort of scheduled as a feature-based work cycle with some time constraints towards the end as we, as we uh, were wrapping work on the translations piece. So we did need to flex a little bit on budget and time. And I think for the most part, we, um, we've been delivering a pretty high quality project. Um, and so I think that's it. Uh, so we do have a YouTube playlist which contains all of our demo videos, um, a link to our GitHub project board and the console space for the VT project. And with that, I will hand it over to Jesse for the first part of the demo. All right, thanks, Mark. Um, so I just wanted to demo um, a couple of the things that we've uh, completed um, either as local exhibits customizations or um, things that have, uh, we've completed upstream in Spotlight itself. Um, so the first thing I want to show is uh, the ability that we now have to do full text hit highlighting. So if I search, uh, this is currently deployed to a stage instance of uh, exhibits.sanford.edu. Um, and we'll be rolling this out to production. Um, we'll actually, uh, some of this functionality is already um, in production uh, now. Um, so uh, you can see as I have searched for this, I've gotten um, a field that says sample matches in document text. Um, if I open that up, uh, we'll see hit highlighting uh, for those terms within uh, this particular document. 
Uh, this is coming from, in this particular case, Alto XML, uh, that we have uh, full or page for page uh, XML files uh, for this content. Um, also, just because uh, to kind of show some of the other functionality and power of the hit highlighting, um, we do have the ability to do things like phrase searching so that you can um, you know, just get the specific uh, hit you, you want previously. Uh, that search was matching terms like just crimes or just the word against. Um, so there is some flexibility uh, in, um, in what we're doing here. Um, also, uh, we've had some work to add multilingual search functionality, uh, particularly for um, Portuguese and Indonesian. Um, so again, I'm doing a, a search for um, the word H-O-M-E-M -E and uh, what you can see here is that we're getting some uh, full text hit highlights uh, that are using kind of non-standard English stemming behavior. Um, so this is kind of stemming behavior that's specific to uh, the, the Portuguese word. Um, so we are able to uh, handle some stemming and uh, better search uh, relevancy for um, Indonesian and Portuguese content. Um, none of this uh, stuff is kind of things that we get by default, so we did have to uh, take some off-the-shelf components that uh, are out there in the open source community and configure them uh, and, and test them a bit to, to get this behavior. So, um, you know, between this and uh, uh, generally the full text highlighting, this, these are things that for the Stanford exhibits context um, are not things that are going to happen automatically. So. Um, you know, we have to have certain, certain um, uh, w ways that we have to treat the content. Um, say, in particular, we want to have the uh, transcription role in our content metadata. So um, I, I guess I'm just calling that out to say that, you know, this isn't something that's going to get rolled out for every single uh, record in the SDR that has OCR uh, associated with it. So. Um, people will you know, want to contact folks in DLSS and, and, and the PSM team to talk about how to get their content, um, kind of uh, their OCR content into uh, a state that it would be able to uh, get ingested into something like exhibits and get this behavior. Um, also, uh, kind of on that point, uh, this is the metadata configuration page here. Um, so what you'll see now is that we have this uh, field down at the bottom that says sample matches and document text. Uh, you may not be able to tell too well, but uh, it's not actually able to be enabled on any uh, different display besides kind of your standard um, search result display. So it's not available in gallery. You can't put this uh, section on the document itself, but it is available uh, in normal search results. And this is disabled by default for, um, for any existing or new exhibits. So um, again, kind of similarly, it's not something that's going to happen by default, uh, but you can go ahead and enable that in your exhibits uh, if you do have the, uh, the full text content being indexed into, uh, into your objects. Um, one final thing that I would like to uh, share today is a feature that we added upstream into Spotlight, uh, but I'll demo here in our instance of exhibits. Um, here I have a browse category that um, is, is just of the judgments uh, in, in this particular uh, exhibit. Uh, if I edit this browse category, we now have a checkbox that says display search box. So if I uh, enable, and this is disabled by default, but if I go ahead and enable that, um, when I go ahead and view my browse category, I will now be presented a, a checkbox that allows me to search within that browse category. Um, so say, for instance, if I was just interested in like the post-trial judgments, um, you know, so I can create the browse category for judgments, but I could pre present a search box to allow my users to filter within that browse category. So say, for instance, I'm now able to uh, just limit myself to the 27 uh, pre-trial judgments out of the 55 judgments that were in this, uh, in this collection. Um, and I will now hand it to... Uh, over for uh, another demo. I'm going to uh, demonstrate the multilingual feature that we've added uh, during this work cycle. Um, 
the multilingual feature is something that um, we've added uh, specifically for, or at least initially for virtual tribunals. Uh, Mark pointed out, pointed out in one of his slides that one of the requirements for virtual tribunals was uh, to be able to show the exhibit in uh, Portuguese and Indonesian languages. Um, but we also at Stanford know of several current and, and upcoming exhibits that will also want to have um, show their exhibit in more than one language. Um, and we think there are people in this, this broader spotlight community um, that are also, also be interested in having the ability to do multilingual exhibits. So this feature has been added to spotlight. Uh, it's not Stanford specific. Uh, to demonstrate um, this feature, um, I'm gonna bounce back between these, these two browsers um, where the one on the right, I'm gonna start on the one on the right here. Um, in, this, in this browser, I'm a non-affiliated uh, user. I'm not logged in. Um, and so I'm just a typical exhibit visitor. Um, so you'll see the same site that um, Jesse just showed. Um, where we have our homepage here and some uh, menu choices to, to navigate around. Um, and you'll notice that, uh, especially up here in the brown, uh, the brand bar up top, uh, there's no, no facility for switching languages here. We're just looking at an English only exhibit. Uh, but if we move over to the um, browser on the left, um, here I'm logged in as the exhibit curator. So I have the ability to switch to the dashboard and um, I can um, uh, access our configuration options. And so the first step in uh, creating a multilingual exhibit is going to the general configuration page where we've added a new tab uh, for the multilingual feature, which is called languages. So we go to the languages tab uh, and this is where we add the languages um, we're interested in um, allowing our exhibit visitors to view our exhibit in. Um, so just to speed things up, I've already added uh, two languages, Spanish and Portuguese, um, down here. And I'll add a third language, um, just so you can see um, how easy it is to add a language. We pick our language from the pull down, we say add. And now that language is shown in our list of current languages. Now you see this, oops, you see this uh, column here, public, uh, which is not checked for any of the languages. Um, and that's why as the exhibit visitor, we did not see any means to change to a different language. Um, that's because we haven't made any of our languages public. Um, so just to show you, um, sorry about that. Um, just to show you how, uh, what happens when we do make a language public, I'm gonna just make a couple of these public. Save those changes. And now when I go back over and look at the site from the exhibit visitor point of view, and refresh my page, you'll see up here in the brand bar, we now have uh, the ability to change into the two languages that we just made public. So we can switch to Spanish. And you won't see too much changing here. Um, there's, uh, this has changed, this label here, you'll see this has changed. Um, the search uh, text here has changed. And I'm gonna switch to Chinese because that's actually a little bit more evident what things are, are we get from making the language public. Um, if I do a search, you'll see there's some other user interface elements. Um, that are now uh, translated. So you'll see the previous and next. Um, some of our pull down labels have been changed. So these are all things that um, are, are common user interface elements across all exhibits. So no matter what your exhibit, these stay the same. Um, and so they can be translated just once and every exhibit can take advantage of them. And so the reason we're able to see them now is because these are, uh, there's been about nine languages that have been translated, and these are actually, the translations exist in Blacklight, the application upon which Spotlight is based. Um, those, those translations have already been made, so if we pick one of those languages, we get these uh, translations for free, essentially. Um, but you'll notice, I'll just go back here, 
Um, you'll notice the homepage, nothing has been translated. These labels aren't translated. Um, the exhibit title, subtitle, menu uh, choices, none of these have been translated um, because these are exhibit specific things that can't be automatically translated once. Um, they have to be translated uh, specifically for each exhibit. So I'm gonna go back over to the administration side of things and um, I'm going to um, show you how you make these translations. So the exhibit specific translations. So um, as soon as you add one language, one or more languages um, in, on this page, we get this new um, menu item under creation called translations. So if we go there, um, this page is how we uh, manage all of the translations for our site. So at the top, um, you'll see these are the three languages that we've added. Um, and for each of these uh, languages, there are the same five tab sections at the top. And basically these tabs are just uh, groupings of translatable uh, items um, that are distributed among these tabs. Um, and at each at the top of each tab, we also have what's a, uh, it's a progress indicator for that grouping of translatable things. So for example, here, uh, general, we see zero of eight. That means there's eight total translatable things and we've made zero uh, translations for those things. So you'll see all these inputs are, are empty. And that's why when we are looking at it from the exhibitor point of view, uh, the exhibit visitor point of view, um, we didn't see the title of the exhibit changed because that cha no translation has been provided for that um, field yet. And same with all the, the main menu items. So um, to show how these, these work, I'm gonna switch to Portuguese where we've actually have made um, some translations. So you see here the numbers, the progress indicators look quite a bit different um, because we've made a bunch of translations uh, for the Portuguese language. So here we've made eight of eight um, translations for the, the exhibit title, the subtitle, and all of our main menu choices here. Um, and um, same with metadata fields, we've, we've translated about half of those. Um, this grouping is uh, search related uh, fields. We've tr translated a bunch of those. Um, browse categories, we have four browse categories. We've translated three of them. And you'll see uh, for all of these tabs, uh, when the curator makes a translation um, and saves it, there will be the screen checkbox um, so that the curator or translator can kind of see at a glance what fields have been translated and which ones, which ones haven't. Um, and let's see, to show how these uh, translations are uh, instantiated in the interface, let me go, I forgot to make Portuguese public, so let's do that. Um, I'm gonna go back to the translations page and go to Portuguese. Um, and now as the visitor, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to refresh this. And we should see Portuguese as a choice here. So I made it public. And so now this is quite a bit different. You'll see that um, we do have our exhibit title translated, our subtitle, our main menu items, um, the facet labels. Um, so these are um, uh, you know, uh, included in, in these lists here that we've made translations for. If we do a search, you'll see even the metadata field labels here have been um, translated, um, as well as things like the, the choices under here and the choices here. So all these um, are coming from the, the, the translations that we've provided through, through these tabs. Um, and if we go to the browse category, you'll see that uh, the browse category uh, titles have been uh, translated and these are where um, the description is translated. So those are the, the basic um, exhibit specific uh, 
UI elements and, and how we translate those. Uh, the one thing I haven't shown is uh, the page content. So this, in any exhibit, this is probably the, the most substantial uh, in terms of uh, textual narrative sort of material um, that will exist in the exhibit. And the pages, the translations for the pages is quite a bit different from the other tabs. Um, and this is because any given exhibit can have uh, many different um, uh, pages, uh, feature and home about pages, you can have essentially an unlimited number of those pages. And each page can have um, quite a bit of, of um, content on the page. So there's not an easy way to just do the similar, uh, you know, input-based uh, translation for those. So the way the pages tab works is essentially a, a sort of dashboard of your pages that lets you manage your translations. Um, and the way this works is um, as soon as you add a language um, to your exhibit, uh, a home page is a copy of the home page is created for each language that you've added. This is a special case, the home page. This is because every exhibit needs a home page um, in every language because if the language is made public and the user uh, changes to that language, we have to show something. So, um, so the home page is the one page that's created automatically. Feature and about pages um, are created uh, basically on demand by the, the curator. When the curator decides to make a translated page, um, they can manually do that. So uh, let me switch back to Spanish just real quick because this is one where we've done no work on the translations. So this is what you see when you first add a language. So you'll see here, we have the home page translated. The title hasn't been translated, no work has been done on it. So this Spanish version of the exhibit homepage is just an exact copy of the English version. Um, but it's there, so if, if um, we switch to Spanish, um, there is a homepage uh, to show. Now you'll see, when we go to Spanish, um, there aren't any feature pages um, that have been made in Spanish yet. So we actually don't show the um, there should be another category here for the feature pages. We don't show that because there's no published Spanish feature pages. Um, but the home page is there. This is the Spanish version. It just happens to be in English because no translation work has been done. If we want, if we are ready to translate it, it's just a matter of um, clicking edit for the Spanish version of the page. And that takes us to our standard, the same interface we use, the widget-based interface we use for um, composing all of our um, pages. Um, and to translate, the curator would just replace all the, the English strings with translated strings. Um, although there's even more flexibility here because uh, the curator could decide for the Spanish version of the page they wanted to do things a little differently, maybe add an extra paragraph in Spanish, uh, maybe move things around, delete a section. All that can be done through the normal page um, editing um, uh, interface. So if we go back to our pages UI here, um, and let me go back to the Portuguese where we've done some more work here. Um, so you'll see here, um, in the Portuguese version, um, we actually have created some pages. We've created our two about pages. Um, and I'll show you those real quick. So if we go to our about section. We'll see here are our two page, our about pages. They've been translated um, and they're published. So that's why the about uh, category shows up and the pages show up. Um, the, we've made one copy of one of our uh, feature pages, and um, I'll show you how we do um, make additional copies now. Um, and, the, and just to point out, um, the reason we do this, um, we make it a manual process of creating the copies of the feature and about pages is because um, the assumption is that it's very possible that uh, the curator may decide to uh, add a language um, at a point before the exhibit in English is completely done. So we don't want to make copies of all the English pages um, in the language um, because then work may be done on the English version and the translated version will now be sort of out of sync. So the idea here is that 
um, the, the curator can wait until the English version of a given page is, is fairly complete um, or they consider it complete and then they can manually say create the Portuguese version of that page. So now we have this Portuguese version of the page. We can go and edit it just as I showed you with the, the Spanish version. We can go in and replace all this text with, with Portuguese text and um, and create our, our version of that page. And then when we think it's ready to go, we can publish it. Let's say this one is ready to go because it's been translated, but I'm not gonna publish this one yet. And we'll save those changes. And now if I refresh um, things from the exhibit uh, visitor point of view, you'll see now we have um, this new menu item uh, because that we now have a uh, published feature page in Portuguese. And I can click on that and I'll see our translated uh, feature page. We don't see these child pages yet because um, they haven't been published. And then uh, there's one last thing I wanted to show about this, which is um, one thing that is the potential uh, sort of worry about this approach to creating translated pages is that once you create, say, this, this feature page we're on here, um, the, the curator at, at a later date, somebody on the team could go in and um, edit this English version of this, this feature page, maybe they add a new paragraph, or a new section, um, and the, the danger is that maybe the translator, the person on the team responsible for translations might not realize that that change has been made, even though maybe they want to make that translation on the, on the Portuguese version of the page. So, um, what we do is when the uh, English version of a, of a page for which there is a, a translated page, um, when the English version of that page has been edited more recently than the language version of the page, such as this example here, where we made our copy, our last edit to our copy, the Portuguese version of the, the about page on April 30th, but then on May 1st, we've edited the English version of that page. When that situation happens, we just show a little uh, warning um, icon and highlight the, uh, the last edit date of the English version so that the curator realizes that these two pages are now out of sync. And they can make a decision on whether or not uh, there is a translation that's needed for this, um, this copy, the, the language version of that, that particular page. Um, yeah, so I think that is um, an overview of the multilingual uh, feature that we've added during this work cycle. Okay, uh, so the last feature that we're going to demo just really quickly is content search. So again, this is the feature uh, which allows you to search within an item. Um, so. Uh, as Jesse talked about during his demo, um, like the full text search, uh, our demo is, or, or the content search implementation is being driven by the Alto XML in this case. So Alto XML is just a specification for providing information about OCR text content um, in, and sort of where, where it appears on the page. Um, while full text search in Spotlight can either rely on object level text, so say like you've got you know, um, one OCR file for all the pages or like a plain text file, um, content search is a little different. So it requires page level OCR, which is what we have for the East Timor documents. So um, what you can see when you uh, when you're searching is you've got this little box down here and it allows you to enter in search terms. So for example, in this case, um, I will search for testimony. So, um, and what this gives you is uh, it's uh, calling this uh, service that we, this IIIF content search service, which, uh, which is searching this particular document for the word testimony and sending back a response that, that gives us information about where, uh, both where, um, on which pages and on which part of the pages it's finding these matches. So in the viewer, um, you can see here that uh, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're highlighting the location on the page for these results. And um, like, 
uh, some other search interfaces we can see, for example, if we search for something else, like I'll search for crimes against humanity or crime against humanity, you will see a number of, uh, of autocomplete suggestions. So if you select this suggestion, it will then give you the, the, same, uh, the same sort of guidance to where things are located on the page. So, so um, and this search interface, so um, we've made some, uh, started to make some minor changes to Universal Viewer, including things like this indication of the highlighting of the active page, um, rem removing a little hint right here about how many hits per page because we are getting this information down at the bottom. Um, this search experience is what we're talking about. There are being more changes, but we're waiting on those changes from the vendor. So. Uh, so just to recap, um, what we completed uh, was the multi-text, uh, multilingual full text search and hit highlighting in exhibits supporting English, Portuguese, and Indonesian. The implementation uh, implementation of the Triple I Content Search API for search within, uh, which has been integrated into SDR's access and delivery tier, support for translation and localization of user-facing content and user interface elements in Spotlight and exhibits. The browse category search widget and some minor uh, usability improvements and resolution of various bugs and technical debt issues. So these were all um, high priority features. And um, I think we, at least in terms of how we understood scope, we've uh, been able to deliver everything that we identified as in scope. And this is pretty good because these were, uh, some of these were very complex and uh, uh, challenging features. So I think we did a good job.